What's going on, smart people, or not smart people like me? Uh, yes, today we're going to continue. We're going to continue our lectures on aerospace engineering, um, rather our general lectures, uh, as they call the series of videos. Um, so, in the previous general lecture, we talked about some mechanics and some stuff from the game Children of a Dead Earth. Um, and one of the very crucial things about it is propulsion. So given our tin cans in space, our tin cans in space with guns in them, how do we get them from point A to point B? How do we even um, do those orbital maneuvers that I discussed then? Like how do we change the tangential vector? How do we even change them out of... Um, how do we uh, manipulate the position of our spacecraft in space? So there are, in the game, there are, um, I believe, four types, four main types of um, engines. There are the chemical rockets, which is the ones that we use today to get rockets off of Earth or to get stuff off of Earth. Earth. We have nuclear propulsion, that's another one. Um, and then I believe there is the, um, the magnetoplasma dynamic thruster. Now for nuclear, the engine either uses fusion or fission and uh, um, reaction to create the hot gas that propels it forward. So, Newton's third law tells us that for every action, there is an opposite reaction. And this also, this certainly applies to rockets. So if I, the basic concept of propulsion is that you throw something, like me throwing the, the marker, my pen falling off my so like me throwing the marker away. So when I throw the marker away, there is a small amount of force that pushes me the other way. So I throw this way, there's a small force that pushes me this way. And that's Newton's third law. So the basic premise of rockets in general is that they throw something really fast out the back and so that creates an opposite force that moves it in the opposite direction. And so it does this, it throws stuff from a board really fast via engines. So let's talk engines. And today we're just gonna be focusing on chemical rockets. Okay, so how do we throw something very, very fast enough for us to get thrust? Well, um, we throw something really fast. You just, you throw it. But how are we going about doing that? We do that via the rocket engine. And of course, yeah, as I said, we're gonna just talk about the chemical type of rockets in this video or in this lecture. And we're gonna be talking about the main and different types of chemical engines that exist in today's society. Um, so, okay. So you throw something really fast. So I have a tank. A tank of liquid, say pressurized water. Pressurized water. And so, okay, I'm gonna puncture it. I'm gonna puncture it. So, since it's pressurized water, it's trying its best to get out of the container. There is some stress on the container because there is pressure in there, and the water is sloshing around trying to get out of the container. So, once I puncture it, the water starts rushing out. There. And since the water is rushing out at a pressurized manner, so there's a controlled or there is a definite um, vector that the water is going through, we get some force going this way. So actually this is the basic premise of a steam rocket. Now here's the thing, if I just puncture a hole, the water tends to spread out really fast. So it's going to spread out like that. It's going to spread out really fast. Of course, there's some going to be going here, but some would be going this way. And 
honestly, that's not what we want. We want to direct that thrust. Um, and so that's the purpose of nozzles, those bell-looking things you see on the bottom of rockets. So we want to direct the thrust. And the thing is, when we, when we make a throat of some sort, like a funnel, and then we funnel that into the nozzle, which directs it, we actually get an increase in thrust. So what I'm gonna do now is taper it. We're gonna taper it now. And then we're gonna add the nozzle. So now, the pressure gets choked at this point and propels and has a higher likelihood and a higher force of propelling the, the liquid out of this nozzle. And the nozzle directs it in such a way where it, it doesn't expand as fast as if we just puncture a hole in the tank. So there, basic premise of nozzle and why rocket engines have nozzles. Now, the thing is, this simple pressurized thing, so I'm gonna add the tank here, let's say nitrogen, that helps us pressurize the water. And then we're gonna put a, uh, let's put a valve here, so that we can control the flow of our water. So this is N2, nitrogen. So you have ourselves a basic, what is called a pressure-fed rocket engine. And the pressure-fed rocket engine is just uh, an engine that uses pressure to push the propellant inside the tank. So the water here, or what the thing that we're throwing all overboard to produce thrust is what is called the propellant. So we're using pressure now to push the propellant out of the tank and through the nozzle and outwards to produce thrust. Um, of course, you can have your propellant or your tanks pre-pressurized, but suppose that we're pressurizing using a gas like hydrogen. Of course, that's gonna leak really fast. So we need another tank, a separate tank, that pressurizes the other tank or the main tank. So that's the ideal thing that we want to do. Okay, so I'm gonna add the valve here so that in case something critical happens with the nitrogen, it doesn't affect the water. Or we can easily control the flow of the pressure here and here. Now an important thing to note about pressure is that it always goes from high to low, never the reverse. This is actually a gas or pressure version of the second law of thermodynamics where things go from hot to cold, uh, a hot to cold, never the reverse. Um, but except this time it always goes or pressure always goes from high to low and never the reverse unless we're trying to pressurize an object or a uh, yeah, object or tap. So as we as we open this valve, open this valve, and let these let this N2 push the H2O out of the engine, we lose pressure from at, as time goes on. And then eventually, um, the pressure in these two tanks equalizes with the pressure outside, and we get no thrust. And that means that we have expended all our propellant in that um, it is no longer producing thrust. So you're thinking to yourself now, um, what is a faster way of pushing the liquid into, you know, out the nozzle? Well, let's, let's take a little shortcut, shall we? What if we were to push the rocket using an explosion, a controlled explosion? Um, of course, it's somewhat chaotic, but it is just enough that we can do the math and control it. Okay, so a neat thing that we discovered is that when we burn, when we burn certain materials with oxygen or other oxidizing agents like nitrous oxide or um, uh, like maybe compounds that contain oxygen itself, maybe liquid oxygen, we realize that we get a big combustion or sometimes a deflagration, but nonetheless, we get thrust if we put a plate on top of it. So, um, put in a bowl, right? You put some, 
you put some flammable hydrocarbon, like let's say maybe paraffin wax um, or butane, and then you burn it, or if you ignite it, it burns because we have oxygen in our atmosphere. Now, what if in a closed environment, we burn pure oxygen with our given hydrocarbon or our given chemical that contains hydrocarbons? We get ourselves a pure explosion or combustion or deflagration. And that is the principle or the basic principle now of most, co most chemical rockets that, that, that are actually used in the space launch industry. So we have what is called a fuel and an oxidizer. And before I talk about fuels and oxidizer and actual rocket engines, let's talk about jet engines first. So I'm gonna draw a simple jet engine here. So this is the outer, sh the outer, um, the outer wall of the engine. And let's make something called a compressor. And then the main fan, the big fan you see uh, on the engine of aircraft. And then a shaft that leads into the compressor. And then let's make small, tiny fans inside the compressor. Okay. So this is a basic jet engine. It's called a turbofan to be specific. Um, so what happens is that it sucks air in, air in, and then the thing is it only uses fuel because of course we have oxygen in our atmosphere. Um, so it doesn't need an oxidizer to combust things or to combust fuel. So when air gets sucked into the compressor, it gets ignited with a little bit of fuel, just, to, just enough, for it to spin these small fans inside, so the small fans spin the bigger fan, and then it sort of cycles around. So the big fan pushes air inside the compressor, the air gets combusted inside the compressor, and it pushes the fans inside the compressor, and then it turns the main shaft. And so it just cycles around and it feeds itself. It's like a never ending loop. Um, so now the majority of the thrust that is produced by these engines are the ones that are passing by. And that's another reason why the fan on a turbofan engine is big. Because we're able to push more air out given few fuel. Now that sometimes that requires gearing it down, having a gearbox right here, increasing the torque of the, uh, the fan itself. But nonetheless, that's the basic principle. So we burn something so that we push it and I guess it helps us cycle things more and increase our thrust and efficiency. So, now think of jet engines, but in space. Now the thing is, jet engines don't work in space because there's no oxygen in space, it's a vacuum. Uh, well, not a total vacuum, there are some hydrogen particles going around from time to time. Um, nonetheless, it still doesn't give us the required materials for us to combust things and produce meaningful thrust. In fact, our hydrocarbon or our fuel will not burn in space because there really is no oxygen. So that's why we need the oxidizer. I know it's a bit inefficient to use oxidizers at such low altitudes because we literally have air on, we can just use that. And that's actually the purpose of some air breathing engines or air breathing rocket motors. Like the one used by the Sabre space plane, um, where it's, it's, it's just a regular jet engine at sea level. And then once it gets to space, it switches to a special mode wherein it becomes a rocket engine, where it uses oxidizer rather than the air around us. So you have your fuel, you have your oxidizer, you burn them, and that produces meaningful thrust. So of course, we put them into separate tanks. We don't mix them together immediately. So we have one tank here, one tank here. Of course, we don't make it square-ish because that's gonna make things explode because pressure doesn't like that stuff. Okay, round out the edges. Okay, and then, of course, we're gonna, we're gonna want things to go fast. So let's have a small tank of nitrogen that feeds into both of these tanks to pressurize them both. And then we have our valves. And then so, okay. So we're gonna leave these, these two um, materials or two propellants. 
into what is called a combustion chamber, wherein we actually do the explosion or the combustion. And then we do exactly what we did with the pressure fed system a while ago. Pressure fed um, just water, water engine. And then we choke, we choke the we choke the combustion so that we get more thrust out of it once it gets out of the nozzle. So it exists, um, once we combust the fuel and the oxidizer, we get really, really hot gas moving outside of the engine now. So you have really hot gas moving out. And the velocity that every particle of you know, combusted fuel oxidizer that exits the engine, uh, or here, is called the exhaust velocity, or the exit velocity. It's mostly denoted by uh, VXH. And in fact, this is a crucial part of the original delta V equation. So if, if you guys recall, delta V is equal to the natural log of the dry mass over the total mass of the rocket times the engine's specific impulse times the gravitational constant of your uh, body, where it's just 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. But you'll notice that the original um, delta V equation, or the Tchaikovsky rocket equation, is actually delta V equals the exhaust velocity of the rocket engine times times the natural log of your dry mass and your total mass. This is the Tchaikovsky rocket equation. And this is one of the menaces of the aerospace engineering um, community or industry. Because when we have, or when we combust our fuel and oxidizer, of course we want thrust, right? Now, you're maybe thinking, why not just add more engines to the rocket? Well, of course, we have to account for the weight of the rocket itself, or the weight of the, and the weight of the engine. So that means we have to put stages so that we get to con conserve fuel, right? And have more delta V to get into orbit and go to other planets. But the thing is, well, the more we add boosters, or the more we add engines to the rocket, the heavier it gets, and so that means we would require more boosters or more tanks. And those tanks would need to be propelled as well, so, no, so more engines. And so it just keeps cycling, and it's a madness because you end up with a rocket that's very inefficient and very not cost effective because you have so many things on it now. Okay, so this is the exhaust velocity of your hot gas moving out from the combustion. So this here is just a simple pressure fed system. So it uses pressure to push out the fuel and oxidizer, which are combusted in the combustion chamber, and let out a nozzle which directs the thrust. And it's a bit choked here. There's a throat here. Yeah, it's called the throat of the engine. Where in the thrust is choked so that once it gets out, it's actually it has it actually has more velocity once it exits the engine. But we do need to take note about um, about the throat diameter because if it's small enough, the pressure might overwhelm the material of the combustion chamber and make your, your rocket engine explode. So we need to take note about the pressure of things. And that's why you see many pressure gauges on rocket engines. Why there's a pressure gauge here, there's probably a pressure gauge here, pressure, pressure gauge, gauge on, gauges on every tank. There's probably one to here before the oxidizer and fuel enter the engine. Now actually, there are two types of rocket engines out there. There's a solid motor, solid fuel rocket engine. Right now we're talking about liquids. I believe the next one, uh, or maybe a footnote, I'm gonna talk about solid ones, because there's not, nothing really much in the way of discussing solid rocket engines. The advantage of liquid, liquid um, rocket engines is that we can throttle them. We can put valves here and control the flow of the liquid and thus control the thrust of the rocket. But unlike the solid rocket engine, uh, where it just burns and we can't really do anything about it because it's solid. Um, hybrid, on the other hand, is very, um, it's a mix between a liquid and solid rocket engine, but the thing is, it's either very inefficient or very impractical. So either you go, you go completely liquid or you go completely solid. 
as your choice says, when you're trying to build a rocket. So that's a pressure fed system. So, okay, let's apply the principles of rocket, uh, of, I mean, of jet engines to our rocket engines. So, okay, so we have our tanks, we have our fuel, we have our oxidizer. So, fuels either, there are many types of fuels. The most commonly used fuels is hydrogen. Um, there are, there's either hydrogen. There's RP-1, or it's a special type of petroleum, um, like jet engine fuel, um, that's actually made for rockets. Uh, if I remember, there's also methane, which is commonly used now for, um, especially in the SpaceX Raptor engine, it uses methane and uh, liquid oxygen. Now, the majority of um, rocket engines use liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. Liquid oxygen, no liquid oxygen, oxygen, not gas, gaseous oxygen because um, it's actually more denser and you can pack more of them into the into the tank if it's liquid in liquid form. Okay, so to increase the thrust of our engine and to increase its efficiency, what we want to do is increase the flow of the to propellants into the rocket engine's combustion chamber. So to do that, of course, we initially tried one where we have a separate tank of, say, nitrogen or other pressurized gas that pushes the propellants down into the combustion chamber. So what if now, what if I have a pump, like, say, a, something that pumps water through our houses, but something more compact, of course. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a small diagram here. So you have a pump, first for the fuel, and then there's a shaft that also leads to the oxidizer, all right? So they lead into these two pumps and the pumps increase the, the flow rate of both of these liquids into the combustion chamber. And then of course you have our nozzle and there. Uh, and of course we combust these things inside the combustion chamber and then we create the combustion and then that produces thrust. There, connect that, okay, there. So this is a simple turbo pump system. Now the thing is, how do we turn the, turn the pumps? Well, one way, that w one way to spin it is an electric system. So we have an electric motor, a really, really strong one here, that spins the shaft that increases the flow rate of the fuel and the oxidizer. This is the principle used by the Rocket Lab Ruler 4 engine. And it's actually pretty neat that that's 3D printed, uh, easily manufacturable, and it uses, quite frankly, a more uh, safe and eco-friendly way of increasing flow rate of the fuel and the oxidizer. But what most aerospace companies um, do, especially with the SpaceX Merlin engine, is that what they do is they have a small, tiny rocket engine, a small, tiny rocket engine over here, say, that spins the shaft. And so they combust a small amount of fuel and oxidizer, um, either piped directly into this thing, or this small rocket engine, which we call the pre-burner. And then the pre-burner spins the pumps. And so I guess the resulting gas in the pre-burner is just dumped right beside the rocket engine. This is called an open cycle rocket engine. We're in, we use the fuel and the oxidizer to um, power a small engine, a small mini engine on the engine. That, no, not right now, Chen. Fuck off. I'm just watching. Uh, and then so that spins the pumps and increases the flow of the fuel and the oxidizer. This is actually really effective. But the thing is, um, you have some wasted material here, a byproduct over here. Let's just pipe this way. Okay, so okay, you may be thinking to increase the to increase the flow or to increase efficiency of some of the fuel and the oxidizer. Why not just pipe this into the combustion chamber so that we can use those um, leftover hydrocarbons or uh, byproducts of the mini engine that you can see? I feel like doing that. I swear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm not gonna get even more interrupted. 
Um, yeah, why don't you just pipe it into here? Well, now you're talking about the closed cycle system um, or type of rocket engine. You just pipe this into the combustion chamber. And in fact, this is what the Rocketdyne F1 engine used, which sent the Saturn V into space and America to the moon. So it's a closed cycle. Um, actually, it was, it's open cycle, but they just piped it into the nozzle. But the problem with closed cycle is that if you're using a fuel like RP1, which is rich in carbon, the byproducts of our pre-burner ends up being soot, a lot of soot, S-O-O-T. And the thing is, those might clog up your injectors. Well, the injectors just simply, well, um, inject the fuel and the oxidizer at the right amounts for us to get an ideal combustion. So that's closed cycle. Okay, um, to solve this, to solve the, the problem of soot and other byproducts clogging our engine, what we want to do now is to increase the, well, let's say, let's, let's start over. Let's start over, okay? So we have our fuel and our oxidizer. Let's start over. Start over. Hello, two there. Or hello, X. Lox, and then. Okay, so what we're gonna do is have two separate pumps now. Or let's have one pump power another pump. Or let's have one pump being like having both the oxygen and or. Actually, let's just use the pre burner. Let's use the pre burner itself. And then spin one pump. Um, that's just the oxygen or the fuel. So we have our mini rocket engine over here. We have the main shaft. And then we have one pump only. And then we pipe both the fuel and the oxidizer into the mini rocket engine. Um, but a majority of, let's say, the fuel goes into this mini pump and then goes out into the combustion chamber. And so I guess this one, this rocket engine exhaust is, or this small mini rocket engine exhaust is put directly into the combustion chamber. Now this is called a staged, staged cycle engine. Wherein we have, or actually it's called a fuel rich staged combustion engine. Wherein we're only, we're focused on the fuel here when it comes to increasing the speed off. And it still works the same way, or produces, actually it's sometimes more efficient than different kinds of other rocket engines like say the closed cycle engine or the open cycle engine. And of course it's, it's oxidizer counterpart. It's just instead of the fuel, we pipe the oxidizer into the pump or into the main pump. And so that would be an oxidizer or oxygen rich closed cycle engine. Now if we have two separate of these guys, okay, let's Let's complicate things further and okay, extend the shaft into this new um, new pump. Let's just move this pump down a bit. Let's move this pump down. And then we pipe the pump into the combustion chamber. Okay. There. And then we have another pre-burner here. And then we have another thing. And then this time locks. This time the this time we have a oxidizer oh, bridge. Oh my god! I forgot to leave your ID yesterday. Okay. And then fuel goes into here. And this is what is called the full flow stage combustion engine. We're in. We both have fuel rich and oxidizer rich. Um, stage combustion engines mixed together into one. And okay, I'm gonna follow up on the expander cycle engine or um, rocket engine in a footnote because it's time for me. So I'll see you guys then.